Well, hello, Internet, and welcome to my Objective-C tutorial. In this one tutorial, I'm going to teach pretty much everything you'd like to know about Objective-C, and also, as a side effect, I'm also going to teach a lot about how to program in C, because they are quite similar. I'm going to be programming using Xcode, but for the Windows users out there, I'll also show you exactly what programs you need to run this code, because it will run on a Macintosh, Linux, or on a Windows machine. So I have a lot to do, so let's get into it. Okay, so for those people that are on Windows, this is what I suggest if you want to be able to compile Objective-C programs. You would either use ming.w.org and download mingw or go to sigwin.com and download this and you'll be able to compile all of the Objective-C programs that I have here in this tutorial. Now let's jump over and start writing some code. Now like I said, I'm going to be using Xcode here, but I'm also going to be using the terminal or command line to show you how to execute those, and I just opened up Xcode, and I'm just going to click on OS X application and command line tool, and click on next. I need to give this a name. I am going to call this Objective-C Tut for tutorial. I'm going to leave Derek Bannis in there and then here you're going to put a unique thing. So I just put my website backwards and I'm going to start off actually by writing a C program and then I'm going to work my way towards Objective-C. Then I'm going to click on next and it's going to say where do you want to save this? So I'm going to say that's perfectly fine and I'm going to open that up. And whenever you open up your file inside of Xcode you're going to see all this stuff. What we want to do is we want to come over here on the left side of the screen and specifically open up main.c. That is going to be where your code is going to execute. And like I said, this is a C program right now. Now basically, like I said, the code in the main function right here is what is going to be executed anytime you run your program. And if you're wondering what these attributes are right here, whenever you would run your application from the command line or the terminal, you'd be able to pass in the number of words being passed into this function, as well as a list of those words inside of an array. And I'll demonstrate that here in a second. But first, let's focus in on exactly what printf is. You've probably seen this before. Basically, all printf is going to do is it's going to print whatever words you have inside of these double quotes and then the backslash n is for a new line which just means skip to the next line and let's come in here and let's use the array that could be potentially passed inside here just to see how that works or what the heck let's just run it and see what happens so you can see here I just ran it and hello world shows up down there so that's all printf does is it just prints out whatever you have here on our screen now let's delete this and let's do something a little bit more advanced for looping I'm sure you're aware we're very often going to to use for loops and they are structured inside of C and Objective-C in exactly the same way. First we're going to initialize a variable and let's just have it be i is equal to zero and this guy right here is going to change in some way as the for loop loops and performs actions that you see right here over and over and over again as long as this condition right here remains true. So I'm going to say that I want to continue looping or increasing the value of i as long as i has a value that is less than argc, this guy right here. Whenever we pass an array, which is just a bunch of boxes that contain values, into the main function, what this is going to do is to allow us to iterate through all of those different things. So if you sent in a sentence that was something like, I am happy, I am and happy would all go into different boxes inside of an array. And they would have a label or index of zero for I, one for am, and two for happy. And it's probably better just to look at this, or if you have programmed, you've seen this already before. And this is just shorthand notation right here for increase the value of I by one. That's all that means. So what we're going to do is cycle through this array, and I'm going to use printf here again, and I'm going to say arg, and this is going to be the argument type that we're increasing right here, and I'm going to put a percent sign followed by d, which means that we're going to be placing inside of there an integer or a value that doesn't have a decimal place, then a percent sign and an s, which means I'm going to be passing in a string, and then a new line, which means I want to skip to the next line after it does that. Here, I'm going to then send the value for i and put it right here, and then I'm going to get the value for our array that's passed inside of here, and put an i there, and remember, like I said, everything's going to start off with a zero, and then increase a zero, one, two, three, as you're going to see here in a moment. Now I'm going to use the command line on purpose just to execute this. 
And I opened up my terminal or command line and I changed the directory to where I have all of these files listed. And I'm going to show them all right here. You can see Objective C Tut, that's the name of the project I created. So let's just jump inside of there. And then you can see the main.c file, which is the name of the file that's over here on the left side of the screen. Now, if I want to compile this program, I'm just going to go GCC main.c and you're going to do this on Windows as well. And I'm going to type in standard is equal to C99. And now if we hit LS, we're going to see A out is there and that is the guy that we want to execute and to execute that we're just going to then go dot forward slash a dot out and then followed by whatever you want your string to be to pass inside of there and here you can see there is the command passed in here to this array as well as each of these string values also passed into the array and you can also see the indexes that those are all passed into just wanted to cover exactly what all this stuff means. You're not going to use it very often, but now you know. As well as you have an overview of exactly what for loops look like and what printf does, but we're going to get more into that later. If you're using Objective-C and you want to get rid of this bar over here, which we're not going to be using that much, you can just click on this little guy there and that'll go away. And likewise, if you do not want the debug area over here, you could come over here and click on this guy and that'll go away as well. And then we'll just have our output from our application that's running here on the screen. Didn't mention it here, but this include statement is just going to include a whole bunch of functions that we'll be able to use. Functions like printf to be able to do all sorts of other different things, which we'll demonstrate here as we go on. And now I'll jump into the different variable types that we'll be able to use to store data. Now, basically there's a ton of them. We have short, and I'm gonna also say exactly what we're going to have to use here if we want to transport a value stored in this variable over inside of here, inside of this string to be printed out. And in that situation, it's going to be percent sign %d, just like we had before. Likewise, you're also going to use percent sign %d with integers, and with longs, we're going to be using percent sign %ld. Floats, or values that have a percent sign, are going to use percent sign %f. Doubles, which are just like floats, except they're quite large, are going to be using .lf. Then you have characters, which we're not going to be using that much, but if you ever feel the need, you're just going to use percent sign %c. And there's a couple other different data types, but we're going to focus in here on structs as well as pointers as the tutorial continues. And a struct is just a custom data type, which is better to understand once you see it. And a pointer is going to hold the location of data somewhere inside of your memory. So what we're going to do right now is I'm just going to bounce around and create all kinds of different things. I'm going to start off by creating a float and let's call this f temp and whenever you're defining the names for your variables we usually use camel casing which just means a lowercase letter followed by an uppercase for each individual word you want to focus in on for your variables so that's just creating a data space for me to be able to store information now i'm going to use printf again and this time i'm going to allow the user to enter information so i'm going to say enter temp in fahrenheit and we always want to put a semicolon here at the end of our statements. Now, if I want to get information from my user, I could use scan f. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define exactly what data type I expect, which is going to be a float. That's what's going to be sent to the user. And then we're going to put and f temp, and we're going to get more into what the and part is in a little bit. But for now, just put and and f temp, whatever the variable is. Now, what we'll be able to do is create another float, and this is going to be c temp, which is going to represent Celsius. Here I'm going to perform a little bit of math. I'm going to say I'm going to want to get the Fahrenheit temperature and subtract 32 from it and then divide by 1.8. And that is how we perform subtraction as well as division. And now after I created that, I could then go print F to find exactly what I want to put here. I want to put a float. And let's just say I want one decimal maximum after that float. Then I'm going to put the F right there and degrees Celsius. And we'll throw in a new line as well. And then after that, of course, we have to say what we want to the value of the variable we want to put right there. And that's going to be C temp. And if we execute that, you're going to see down here, it says enter temp for Fahrenheit. And let's just say I say 70 degrees. And it's going to chuck back 21.1 degrees is what that would be in Celsius. Something that's also useful to know is exactly how big of numbers we can store in these guys. Because basically, whenever we say something has a data type, what we're really saying is, hey computer, I want you to set aside a certain amount of memory, which we have a limited amount of, for the data type that I want to store there. Now, the biggest integer that we could possibly store, and let's just call this big int, is 214-748-3647. Then what we're going to do is we're going to prove that that is the biggest integer that we could possibly store, and we're going to put in an integer is what we want to store there, and then we're going to get 
big int and add one to it. Well, you're going to get a negative number. And this, by the way, is the absolute smallest number you can store in an integer. So just be aware that there are size constraints in regards to how large of the different data types we're going to be able to store. Now, a long is also a whole number type. However, we're going to be able to make much larger longs. As you can see right there, that's the largest long we could possibly create. And if we want to save that and we want to execute this, you're also going to see that that gives you a negative number, and that is the absolute smallest big long that we'd be able to use. So pretty much every data type in one way or another is going to have limitations. But there's outside libraries we can use whenever we want to be able to work with bigger numbers like that. If we want to be able to find out the absolute minimum float that we could possibly work with, we could come in here and let's put a percent sign and E, and there's actually a constant that is going to tell us exactly what the minimum float is. And there's also a constant to show us what the maximum float is. And we could execute that. But as you see right there, it actually says undeclared identifier. What are we gonna do? Well, that basically just means we need to include another library. And in this situation, we wanna use the math library. And we're also going to want to use a float library. So now if we run that, you can see right here both the most negative of floats that we could create in our system as well as the highest possible positive value we could store. And of course those are also going to be decimal places. However, it's very important to know that whenever we're using floats or doubles that they lose precision after six digits. And we just come in here and demonstrate that. So let's say I go and create a float, give it the value of pi, and then we'll go point and we'll go one, two, three, one, two, three, and then one. Remember, it only has precision up to six digits. And then we can come in here and try to print out seven digits of accuracy, and then go pi plus. And in actuality, we could also have the computer tell us straight off how accurate it is, how many digits. So we'll say precise decimal digits and have that print out as well. And remember, this is a C program, but like I said, anything that's done in C, we could also do in Objective C. And if we run that, you'll see right there, 1415926, this says 1415926, even though we went in there and added an additional digit. It completely ignored it. And you can see right here, precise decimal digits goes up to six. So now that we spent a lot of time on different variable types, let's get into comparisons and being able to perform different actions depending upon a situation. So let's create an integer here, equal to age, and that would be 13 I'm gonna put. We can use an if statement that's gonna say if the age is less than or equal to six in this situation, then, and say something like you are in kindergarten. Like most other programming languages, we're also gonna be able to come in here and go else if, and put in another condition. Let's say age is less than or equal to 13. And then finally, as the final condition, we could say something like, you're in high school. And there we go. And if we execute that, you're gonna see you're in elementary shows up here. And the reason why is this is equal to 13. So ifs and elses and elf if statements work in C as well as Objective C in pretty much the same way as other programming languages. And the different comparison operators, this is a comparison operators that are going to be available to us are also very similar to other languages. We're going to have less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, and not equal to. So there's all the comparison operators. So what do we have in regards to logical operators? Well, logical operators are basically gonna allow us to combine comparison operators. And we have and, we have or, and we have not. And it's better to come in here and just demonstrate what those look like. So we could do something like if, and we could say age is greater than or equal to 12, or age is less than or equal to 13, we could then print out something, if that indeed is true, which in this situation it is, and it prints out you're in elementary right there. So basically what this is saying here is when we use the logical operator or if this is true, or if this is true, then I want you to perform whatever is inside of there. If on the other hand, we decided to use the and logical operator, we come in here and create a Boolean, for example, and let's go and import something up here, standard bool, create a Boolean type. I'm gonna say is elementary, and we go equals, and we throw in the same statement we had before, but in this situation, we're gonna have and, and what that's gonna say is, this is going to get a value of one or true if age is indeed greater than or equal to 12 and age is going to be less than or equal to 12. If this isn't true and this isn't true, 
then we're going to get a false or a value of zero. And a Boolean is it going to represent true or false or it's going to represent zero or one, just like I said before. So in this situation, come in here and do another printf statement. Put a D inside of there because it's going to give us zeros or ones, like I said before. And then is elementary. And you can see indeed is an elementary and it comes back with a one or a value of true. And then finally, to cover the last logical operator, we have the not statement. All the not statement is going to do is it's going to turn trues into falses and falses into trues, or zeros into ones and ones into zeros. And then we could do something like not, and yes, indeed, we could use true here. And if we execute it, you're going to see it turned the true into a zero. So those are all the different logical operators. Another thing that we have here for performing comparisons is the ternary operator. So let's go and create another Boolean. And we'll say something like is high school, like this. And what the ternary operator is going to do is it's going to assign a value depending upon the comparison. So I'm gonna say if the age is greater than 13, then I want you to assign a value of one to is high school. So it's pretty much used in comparisons in which you're going to have either or, or come true. Otherwise, if this comparison is not true, we want to assign the value of zero to is high school. Save it and run it, and you're going to see is in high school comes back as zero. Another thing to keep in mind is when we are using if statements, if you would come in here and create an integer called j and give it a value of 10 or whatever, this guy right here is not going to be available outside of here. And we could prove that right now like this and execute it and it's going to say build failed and that just means if a variable is created inside of an if statement and later on if it is created inside of a function that does not mean it is going to be available outside of said function or if statements or for loops or while loops which we're going to get into more here in a second now let's come in here and take a look at some things we can do with math Basically, what we're going to be able to do is perform addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, as well as modulus, which is actually done this way. However, if you would ever want to put a percent sign inside of here, inside of printf, you would just double it up just like I did right there. And if we execute that, you're going to see exactly how those work, exactly like you thought. And if you don't know what modulus is, it's just going to return whatever the value is of the remainder after a division. Another thing you need to do here is cast, and that just means to convert from one data type into another. So let's say we go print up, and we want to get three divided by two is equal to, and we want to float in this situation, well, we could do so. And here what we're going to do is we're going to say three divided by, and if you want to cast the two into a float, you just put this inside of here. If you wanted to convert a float into an integer, you would put int inside of there instead. And you can see right there, now it's going to be able to put in the decimal places. And I covered this before, but if you wanted to shrink that down to only show two decimal places, just point, point 0.2 inside of there. And you're going to see that it goes and only shows two decimal places instead of as many as it feels like showing. Another thing that's important here is order of operations. So let's say that we go print F, and we'll be able to see that if we go 2 plus 1 times 3 is equal to, that that is going to give us a different value than if we used brackets inside of here. Paste that in there, except in this situation, we're going to put these brackets around here. And what that's going to allow us to do is to perform the addition first and then the multiplication thereafter. And you're going to see exactly how that works. Whenever we put the brackets around it, it's going to add this first and then perform the multiplication. Otherwise, it's going to perform the multiplication first and then add two to it. Another thing that's important to understand is shorthand notation that is available. So let's create an integer, give it a value of zero. If we would then come in here and say something like i plus plus is equal to and then put that in there for the integer. What this is going to do is it's actually going to first get the value of i currently and place that right here and then it's going to perform the addition afterwards. Otherwise, if we would instead put the plus plus right here, it's going to perform the addition first and then after do nothing. So let's save that, run it, and you can see it's exactly what it did. Went through here, printed the first value of i, then added 1, then came down here, added 1, and then printed the value out on the screen. So those little things like that can really hang you up. Another thing to know is there's also, there's all kinds of shorthand notation. We'll also be able to go i plus equal to, and let's say 5. What this is going to allow us to do is add 5 to whatever the value of i is. So we'll go i plus equal to, 
five, run that, and you can see that it printed out right there because this has a value of zero. And there's also going to be shorthand notation that's going to allow us to go i minus equal to five or whatever it's going to be. And we'll also be able to do that with multiplication as well as division. Now I could go into all the different math functions that are available, but that would take forever. Basically, we're going to have ceiling, as you can see right there which is going to deal with rounding upwards. Floor, which is going to deal with rounding downwards. You're going to have absolute values, square root, exponents. I mean, there's there's tons of different things that are available to you. Logs and powers. But I'll just let it to you to go and explore the different math library and all the different things that are available for you right there. Okay, so now let's take another look at looping. Now we already talked about the for loop and you can see we're just going to initialize a variable, give it a starting value, and this guy what it's going to do is it's going to print out odd numbers from 0 to 9. So we just throw in our condition once again and that's going to be 10 and we're going to increment it again using shorthand notation like before. And then down inside of here there's a couple other little keywords we can use. Here's our if statement, and we're going to say in this if statement, if i ever reaches the value of 9, what we want to do is jump out of the loop altogether. How could we do that? We would just throw break inside of there. So that's one thing that's commonly used with loops. Another thing, let's say that we also, if we ever get to the point where i is equal to 7, and we want to skip printing 7, it's quite easy, we would just type continue. And what continue does is jumps back up to the top of the for loop and continues going. Of course, this is going to be incremented, however. And then if we just wanted to print out odd numbers, we could say something like if i, and then use the modulus statement with 2, which is if it's an even number, it's going to give me a value of 0. And if it's an odd number, it's going to give me something other than 0, which means we're going to be printing out all of our odd numbers. In that situation, I'm going to go i, and then I'll go and print out the number. So there we are, and then throw our integer on there at the end. And if we run that, you're going to see that it prints out 1, 3, and 5. It doesn't print out 7 because whenever it hit this point, it continued, never got down to this point, and then it prints out 5, and it never prints out 9 because 9 jumps us completely out of the loop. So that is how we're going to be able to use for loops. Now, of course, there's also whiles as well as do while loops. With a while loop, you're normally going to create a variable outside of the actual, the actual looping structure. Let's just call it j. And in this situation, I'm going to say while j is less than or equal to 10. And we'll say printf. And we'll just say j and print out the integer in this situation. Throw that there. And then another thing that's common with while loops is we're going to increment our variable inside of the while loop itself. And if we run that, you're going to see that it's going to succeed and it's going to print out 1, 2, 3, 4 the whole way through 10. And then we have the do while loop, which gets a lot of hate for some unknown reason. What a do while loop does that's different than a while loop is you can guarantee that it's going to loop at least one time every time you use a do while loop because it loops through whenever we type in do and then it checks the while part of it. So we'll say while and let's create something. Let's do like a guessing game or something. So let's say int and guess like this. Come down here and we're going to say that we're going to continue looping through this as long as the guess is not equal to 15. So we can go inside of here and then inside of this guy we could say something like print f and guess between 0 and 20. So we're going to say guess a number between 0 and 20. And then we're going to store whatever they put inside of there inside of scanf. So we can say d. That's We're expecting an integer in this situation. I'm going to put and inside of here. You're going to see here in a moment why that is needed. And then whenever we run that guy, you can say guess between 0 and 20. If we type in 1, it's going to ask us again. 4, and then if we type in 15, then it's going to end. So there's an example of a do while loop. And that brings us to functions. Well, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to jump up here outside of the main area and this is where I'm going to be creating all my functions and basically how why we would use functions is it's going to allow us to both reuse as well as better organize our code. While I'm up here I might as well also talk about global variables. A global variable is going to be able to be accessible meaning its value is going to be accessible in every single function that is inside of your file and how you create one 
is let's say I have pi value. So if we have functions up here outside of main as well as inside of main, we're going to be able to access all of those or access all of those. And another type of version of this is what we would call a static variable. And a static variable will only be accessible by functions inside of this file because otherwise we could have globals that also would be accessible from outside of it just by including them like we included here as you can see. Now let's create a function. So I'm going to say first void. What void means is it doesn't return anything after the application or after the function executes. We're going to be getting a string here so we're going to be using character star name. Once again I'll show you what that means here in a second. We're using pointers and here we have height and then we're going to have another float which is weight. These are going to be values that are going to be passed inside of here. We're going to be getting names, heights, and weights all passed inside of here and then inside of this function we're going to do something with these guys. What we're going to do in this situation is we're going to get the height that they passed in, multiply that times 12, and then multiply that times 2.54 which is going to get us our height in centimeters and I'm just making up stuff to do here so we could also convert our weight to kilograms by multiplying that times 0.453592. And then we could come in here and say printf and get the name that was passed inside of here. Centimeters tall and weighs and have two centimeters for that, kilograms. And then we could just throw in the name, the new height, as well as the weight. And now that we have our function defined, we can just call it and convert data and we can pass in Derek, for example, or why don't we go and do this? There you go, because I want to show you something else. Name is equal to Derek, and then we'll pass in name here. And then for our height, we can say 6.25, and then for our weight, we can say 179. And if you save that and execute it, you're going to see down here it goes and prints all that information out and does all those conversions. One thing it's very important to understand is if we would come in here and say something like print f and then tried to print out our height which we defined inside of our function up above. So here's height right here and here is height right there but height is not down here and as you can see it has an error and if we click on it it's going to say use of undeclared identifier height. Anything that's declared in a function or an if statement or a for loop cannot be accessed from outside of it. And another thing that's important to understand is let's say we came up here and said name is equal to Phil and then we came down here so up there we changed the name to Phil from Derek. We wouldn't then be able to come in here and say name in main S or we'd be able to do this is just not going to give us the result that maybe we expect. So if we execute that you're going to see that Derek shows up even though Phil supposedly was changed up inside of here. And the reason why is whenever we pass these values up here we're not passing the actual variable we're just passing a value. And right after I demonstrate our next function we're going to create that's going to allow us to return values versus void which doesn't allow us to return them. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to create a new function that's going to return a float. It's going to receive a float and two floats and then it's going to return num1 plus num2 and we'll be able to come down here throw printf inside of here once again and we could say something like 5 plus 6 is equal to and point 0.1 get our float and a new line and of course we could call the sum function pass that in there and it's going to return a value just like we expected it would and there you see 5 plus 6 is equal to 11. So now let's talk about pointers now data, like I said before, is going to be stored in memory at an address. And memory is just like a bunch of boxes and the data type that you define for those boxes is pretty much going to define how many boxes you're going to need. So if it's a data type that is expected to be large, then you might use a long or something along those lines. However, if it's supposed to be really tiny, you might use a short or even an integer. So what we're going to do is we're just going to start off here and dig more into pointers. So let's create an int and let's just call it random num just for the heck of it and give it a random value. Now if we want to come in here and get the address location for it, just go random location. We're going to be able to by putting p inside of here for pointer and then to get it we have to go and random number. That's where that and is. So this guy right here is going to return the address in memory for this variable right here. 
execute it, and you can say there it is, it's a hexadecimal number. And why that's going to be valuable is we're going to be able to store these addresses and so forth and pass them in functions. If we would want to come in here and store a address, we're going to both, or first off, we're going to use the same data type for whatever we're going to be storing, and then we're going to follow that up with star adr random num and then get the address for random num right like that so that's important to know if you want to store an address make sure the data types are the same and then put a star before it right like that pointers are nowhere near as complicated as they seem it's just addresses and passing addresses and then getting access to data inside of those addresses we could then come in and store a new value in that address by referring to star adr random number 54321 for example and we just copy this to save a little bit of time random number value and then like this and then change that to a, an integer run it and you can see right there 54321 is showing up right there so if you want to store the address for a variable you start off with and and whatever you want to store inside of there so this is the address of that if you want to change the value then if you have the address you proceed it with a star and then store the new value inside of there something else that might be interesting is even though we change the value the memory address itself is still going to remain the same so we can say random number memory location for example and in memory location we're going to be getting a pointer and then put the and symbol here of course if we run that you're going to see that, yes, indeed, the memory address is exactly the same as it was before, FF7AC. Trust me, it's the same thing, even though we changed the value. And if we wanted to, we could also come in here and get the total number of bytes for our integer in this situation. So random number is, and to do that, you go percent sign and ZU, and we'll get the bytes for that. And to get it, you go size of and then pass in whatever the random number is or whatever the variable is you want to check and you can see here that that is four bytes now something that's really neat is previously we were sending by value to functions what if we wanted to instead send the actual variable and then you would be able to change the value there and then it would also stay true inside of the main function so let's go and create an integer called number two three four five and we're going to create a function called change number just to prove that this works now to pass the address, we're gonna go and, and then number, right like that. And then after we do that, we're going to verify that the number value that we changed inside of the change number function, which we're gonna create here in a second, is going to remain the same outside of here. Now what we'll do is come up here and actually create that function. It's called change number. Come up inside of here, outside of the main function. And this isn't gonna return anything, so we'll have it be void. Then we'll have change number. Now if you're going to be sent an address for a variable, you're going to put the star inside of here instead. I'm just going to call it number again. It doesn't have to be, but that's what's going to be here. And then to change the value of the address that was passed inside of here, we're going to put the star in front of number and call it 987 whatever. So there, change there. So what we're going to do, just to verify, we're going to give number the value of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're then going to say that we want to change it, and then we're going to verify that it was indeed changed. And if we execute, you can see that 98765 was indeed changed, and it changed inside of main because we passed a memory address and not a value. Something else that's really interesting inside of C and Objective-C is we're going to be able to create structs, which I talked about before. It's basically going to allow you to create a custom variable with more than one data type. So let's say we wanted to create a struct, and let's call it superhero. We could then define the name. So we'll say real name, like this, and then another string inside of here. And as you can see, that's what these are. These are character arrays, and they're using pointers as well. If you're wondering why they had stars inside of them, and we um, you know, wouldn't only just store strings inside of them, we could store height, and we could store weight. Just make sure that you end that with a semicolon. We would be able to come in and use this struct, the superhero struct, and let's call it Superman, and we'd be able to assign values very often, like you might feel is normal with um, dealing with objects. So real name, just make sure it's the same thing like we have right there. And Superman again, equal to Superman, Superman again, and we could assign his height, and Superman weight. And then if we would want to come in and use all of that data we just assigned, we could then come in and say there's a string we want to put, is the hero feet tall and weighs percent sign pound. 
bounds. And then if we wanted to get the values that are inside of there, uh, it's easy. We just go Superman dot real name and Superman super name height weight. Execute that and Clark Kent is the hero named Superman. He is 6.25 feet tall and weighs 235 pounds. So that is the gist of C and all of the comparisons between C and Objective C. Now what I'm going to do is focus in 100% on Objective C and talk a lot about objects and all of the different functions available only with Objective C. Okay, so I'm back inside of Xcode and this time I'm going to create an Objective C application. So we're just going to go application, command line tool again, it's going to work perfectly fine. Then we're going to go next. This time we'll change this to Objective C and I'll call this Objective C Tut 2. And again, just whatever your name is and some unique identifier. Click next where you want to store it. And there you can see everything opens up. Let's get rid of this for now. We are going to talk about that in a moment. And you can see here once again we have what is called .m file is also referred to as an implementation file. So there we go. But this is the main part of our Objective C application. Now the foundation part, this import up here, is known as the foundation framework, and it's going to contain many fundamental classes you're going to use in your Objective C programs. And of course, we're going to be importing a whole bunch of other classes in here real soon. See down here, there's main again, and we can get rid of this stuff right here. Going to talk about NSLog and how it differs from printf. But first off, let's talk about auto release pull. Now, as we create objects, memory is going to be set aside for our application as well as our objects. And whenever those objects are no longer going to be needed, there is going to be memory that is going to be deallocated so that that memory will be released for other parts of our application. And an auto release pull is going to do that for us. And you also will often hear about ARC or automatic reference counting. And basically what that does is it just automatically for us signals for the destruction of objects when they're no longer needed. So that is why we're putting all that stuff inside of auto release pull with our little curly brackets. Now NSLog is going to work exactly like like printf are very similar anyway. There you can see right here, it opened up and it printed out hello world. The only difference is, is it's also going to put out like a timestamp there. We're going to be creating a lot of objects. One of them is going to be an NS string and this is a string and it is going to, more specifically, it's going to be a string pointer and very often whenever you are creating an object and you want to define it but not give it any real specific information. You're going to assign it the value of nil, which means that it is a non-existent object inside of memory. And all of these non-existent objects inside of memory are actually going to point to the same place because this is a pointer right here. Once again, in NSLog, you're going to start off with the at sign. And I could say something like location of nil. These are always going to be the same. And it's a pointer, of course. And we could say something, let me just point at nothing like that. And you're going to see the location in memory for nil. And it is always going to be the same, 0x0. Let's now come in here and actually create a real NS string. And it's just a string, that's all it is. So we'll just go NS string, or a pointer to the string in memory, I guess is what I should say. And we can come in and we go at, and then we could say something like, there we go. And because NS string is actually an object, it's going to have a bunch of functions or methods, F as they are referred to. And now I'll show you how to deal with them. First, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the NS string objects and show you how to interact with objects that way. And then I'm going to show you how to make custom objects. So size of string, there's actually a method inside of the NS string object that is going to give us the length of the string. Make sure you put that comma inside of there. And I want to cast this to an integer. And how you would call the quote objects length method or function is right like that. Put it inside of brackets, put the name, and then put whatever the method is you want to call. And if you do so, you're going to see size of string is 40. That means it has 40 characters. And if you count all that up, you'll find out that that is true. So that is sort of the weird objective C way of calling methods, but you can see how that's done. Now to do something a little bit more specific to NS strings, let's say that we wanted to come in here and get a specific character. Let's say we want character in the index of 5. Here we'll actually get the character. There is another method, character at index 5. And that's how you pass in an attribute to a function or method inside of Objective-C, colon, and then whatever you want to pass inside of it. 
also a little bit different from most programming languages and you can see a character at the index of 5 is H and if you count it you're gonna see that that is indeed true you also will be able to come in here and create a dynamic type of string so you could say my name is equal to and by dam dynamic I mean that right here this is a non dynamic it's given a value and it's assigned here we could put in a variable and you know dynamically generate it however if you wanted to do that what we'd have to do well, first off, let's come in here and let's say, let's create a string name is equal to Derek like that. And then inside of here to create a dynamic string, we go string with format exactly like you have right there. Then after this, we put at, and then we can put something like dash, and there's going to be the new string that we're going to be adding inside of there, and then name right like that. And that is how you would create a dynamic string. You could test if two strings are equal. You're going to be using Booleans different type of boolean inside of here versus what we had previously with our c part we call this is string equal and how we could compare whether they are equal is is equal to string is the name of it then you're going to put in my name like that whatever string you want to compare it to and here we're saying is the quote string equal to the my name string well of course that's going to come back false and just to prove that you can still use printf, see, there's printf even though we're inside of an Objective C program or application. So we can say are strings equal, and then we get our answer right here. Is string equal? And if we run that, you're going to see that the answer are strings equal comes back as zero or false. If you wanted to convert an NS string into a regular old string, you could of course do that as well. It's a little bit weird because we're going to have to use what are called nested messages. This is known as a message right here. Whenever we are calling a function or method inside of the object, that's a method. Well, you can actually put me messages inside of messages. Here, I'll just show you what that looks like. You could also create constants with uh, C-O-N-S-T. And in this situation, you're going to need to do that. So C-S string is equal to, and we can say my name. You could also change it to uppercase string if you'd like to. Just throw that in there just for the heck of it. And then if you wanted to convert this into a regular string string, you would follow this with UTF-8 string like that. You don't need the uppercase string part here. I just put that in there just to do it. This is the part you need to do if you want to convert from an NS string over into a regular old string like we have right here. And we can close that off. So what this is going to do is it's going to create an uppercase version of this guy right here, my name. And let's use printf again. And to get it, we'll go you see a string like that and execute it and there you can see it made the name uppercase and it converted it into a regular string and printed it out because that's what we have right there you could also come in and combine strings and we'll just go in a string say something like whole quote and to do that and this is what I mean by nesting or inner messages right like this see there's one of them and then there's one there so we're basically making it uppercase and then we're converting it into a string so want to make sure you caught that so if we want to combine strings we go string by appending string right like this and we can say my name so we're going to tack my name on the end of the quote string we could then come in and search for strings how we do that is we define ns range like this and we could call this search result is equal to and we could say whole quote and then we have to define range of string and then an at sign and whatever string we specifically are looking for I'll just put my name inside of there and this doesn't have anything to do with whether it's uppercase or lowercase it'll find it either way then what we could do is we could say if search result dot location is equal to ns not found and we could print out an ns log inside of here say something like string not found else in that situation that means it was found and we could say something like printf derek is at index lu and is lu long it's going to tell me the index it's at and how much space it's going to take up and to get that information we go search result and location there you can refer to attributes or properties or variables of the objects by using just a regular old dot operator and then search result again and then if you wanted to get the length 
for it. That's how you do that. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of these guys. I'm not going to show you every one of them, but you can see index 42 and it's five long and there's five characters. So you can see that's true. We could also come in and replace a strub string by defining at what index to start replacing and then how many letters to replace. How we're going to do that is with NS range again. And let's just call this range is equal to, we're going to go NS make range like this. And we're going to start at the 42nd character because that's where we said it was. And then we're going to say five characters is how many we want, to, we want to replace. And then we can go constant character. And let's say we want to call this new quote is equal to. And we could go whole quote followed by and then string by replacing characters in range. After you do this enough, you'll eventually get used to using it. There it is, string by replacing characters in range. Objective-C is a little bit weird. There's some strange sort of things it wants you to do here. But either way, then you type in your range with string. It automatically knows what you want to put inside of there. And then let's just say that I want to come forth and say I did not create that quote, but it was an anonymous quote. So we'll just put anon inside of there. Get rid of all this stuff. And then let's also convert this into a regular string, UTF-8 string, like that and like that. And then we could print that out. So just print, print F and new quote. And there you can say dogs have masters while cats have staff. And you can see that it replaced my name with anon or anonymous. Now, one thing that is you should know about using an S string is this is what is called an immutable object. Sounds like a big word. It just basically means that once you assign a value to it, that value cannot be changed. We're going to be creating new arrays every single time we make any type of changes. If, however, you wanted to have strings that could change, you're going to instead use NS mutable strings. So let's say we wanted to create a grocery list, for example. We could do so, and this is going to be NS mutable string, like this. If we wanted to define the initial capacity, but knowing that it could definitely change, we're going to say string with capacity and then give it a value of 50. We could then append a value to this string by just going grocery list and append format and then put in all the different things that we would like to add to it. We can go string like this and then we could say something like potato, banana, and pasta. And that's how we could append to our mutable string. Grocery list. If we want to put these values inside of here, we're going to put percent sign and ampersand and then just grocery list like that. Make sure you come in here and put an at sign in there. Da, 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 da. And there you can see it printed out all of our grocery list items. We can come in and delete characters in a range also with the mutable string. We're just going to say grocery list again. And then we'll define the start and the end. So to do that, delete characters in range like this. And then this is going to be NS make range like that. And then we're going to say start at the first and then go to eight outwards and delete all those characters. And we can see here exactly how these would be changing. There you can see potato, banana, pasta. And here we deleted the potato part off of there. Could also come in and insert a string in an index. Grocery list again. And then we could just go insert string at sign. And we could say apple. Close that off at index and then change that to 13. Print out our grocery list again. And there you can see apples on there now. We could then also come in and replace characters in a range. We're going to say grocery list again. Replace characters in range. Exactly like that. We're going to say NS make. And we'll say we start at the 15th and five characters long. And then with string, we're going to change that to orange. And then we can print out our grocery list again. And there you can see apple's been replaced with orange. And now we're going to take a look at how arrays work inside of Objective-C. So NS array is the name for an array inside of Objective-C. And let's say we have something like office supplies. We could then define them by putting the at symbol like this, followed by all of the different things you want inside of here. So we'll say pencils and arrays are just like boxes inside of boxes that all have indexes or labels or whatever you want to refer to them as. And we'll go paper. We'll then be able to access the different values inside of these guys by going nslog 
at and let's say we want the first item inside of here we'd get that first item by percent sign and at symbol and then remember the first item inside of an array is in index zero start off by counting to zero and then we could come in here and print all of them out if we'd want again we're going to do the same sort of similar thing at sign and office supplies and we put the at symbol in there again and this time we'll just type in office supplies no specific anything and run that and you can see that the first thing in our array is pencils and you can see right here office supplies and it's going to print all of those out all at one time you could of course search for items inside of here again we'll just create a boolean value and we'll check to say or check to see if it contains an item to do so office supplies of course is an object and one of the methods inside of it is contains object that guy right there and we'll just put inside of there exactly what we're looking for which is pencils and then we could come in and check pencils need pencils whatever you want to put and d execute and you can see right here need pencils comes back true that means true that the pencils are inside of the array could also get the number of items inside of our array quite easily at symbol and let's say we want to say total and let's convert this into an integer have to do that cast and then we'll just call office supplies again and the specific method we want is count again comes back as two and we know that that's true now that we know that the pencils item is inside of there it might be useful to be able to jump inside of there and get the index of it so ns log at index of pencils is at and then here we're going to put lu and this is going to be an unsigned long that's how we do a cast for that and then to actually get the index we go office supplies again followed by the method called index of object there it is and then we just tell it specifically what we're looking for and in this situation that is pencils semicolon and index of pencils is at index zero now again ns array by default is going to be immutable which once again that just means that it is not going to allow us to change it it is going to have to create a new array each time if you want to create a mutable array that you can add objects to you go ns mutable array and let's say that we want to create one called heroes this is ns mutable array of course and we can define a capacity to start off with but like i said we can add to it array with capacity and let's just start this off at five we can then easily add heroes by just going heroes add object and then we can put in batman or whatever you want to put in here and we'll throw a whole bunch of these in here we could then easily also come in just by calling the heroes method and insert an object inside of here let's say hey we forgot superman so let's throw him inside of there and we can say where we want to put him at index and let's just throw him in the second index and it's automatically going to make room for him and let's show exactly what we have here and there you can see it printed out all the heroes batman superman wonder woman kid flash all of them all in one place now if we can add items of course we're going to also want to be able to remove items so we can go heroes remove object and let's say that we want to remove flash we can do that we could also remove an object at a specific index so heroes remove object at index like this and let's say we want to remove whatever is in index zero and there we go we just did that we could also come in and remove objects by name so heroes remove object identical to and let's say we want to remove superman we could then go in range and define a range for this ns make range and change this from zero and then change this guy to one and then finally we could actually iterate through our array and to do that just go four start at zero that's the first one while i is less than if we want to get the number of heroes that we have heroes count and then go ns log and print all of those out on the screen and of course we can refer to them all by whatever their index is and there you can see it printed out wonder woman and kid flash which were the only heroes left after all the other changes we made and now it's time for us to create our own custom objects and to do so we're going to come over here to our project right there and we're going to go object right there and then file new we're going to select coco class and click on next we're going to call this guy animal and subclass of ns object which is the number one object that is used for everything and click on next and then we'll click on create and here you're going to see it actually created a header file and this is where we're going to be declaring our instance variables or properties or attributes or whatever you want to call them 
as well as the methods and then in the m file that is where we're going to be implementing or writing the code for our methods so we're going to start off in our header file and you can see right here the object that it is going to is the super class for our animal object it's going to inherit everything that is in the ns object and in the header part dot h this guy right here that's what we're in right now we're going to define our attributes for our objects and these attributes are not going to be directly accessible however getter and setter methods are going to be automatically generated as long as you want them to be and how we're going to create those well first off let's say we want to create an attribute that is not or a variable or an instance variable or whatever you want to call it that is not going to be settable what we would do is go at property and read only this is not going to have a setter method generated for it automatically and let's just say that it's an ns string and it is called name so that is how we would create something that could not be set from directly for our object however instead we're not going to do that for now instead we're going to allow this value to be changed now let's think about our animal and all the other different attributes it should have it should also have a favorite food probably let's make that an ns string create another one property and a string and maybe it'll have a custom sound that it uses let's also create a primitive inside of here property float weight and just remember if it's a primitive it's not an object that means it doesn't need the little star inside of there which is our pointer and then we need to define different methods that we want to use inside of here well every time you create an object it is going to call an initialization for our object which is going to set certain attributes that we might want to set so those are automatically generated by default for us but let's say that we want to come in here and define a custom way for us to initialize our files. Now again, remember we're in the header section here. So what we're gonna do is define what will be returned. So an instance type, which is going to be specifically an animal instance. And then we could say something like init with name. And let's say that whenever this is created, it's automatically going to be passed a string. Have to put the star there. And let's say that it's going to be possible to create an animal object and pass in a default value. Let's go and create a couple more methods. Let's say we have another method that our object's going to have that is not going to return anything, and it's going to be void. And the negative part, whenever we put that there, that means that this is an instance method, which means it's a method that's specific to objects that we create of type animal. If we put a plus sign in there, however, that means it's a class method. And a class method will not be accessible whenever we create an animal object. We'll get more into that here as we go on. So let's say this one is just get info. It also has not passed any attributes. While this doesn't really have much to do with an animal, I'm just trying to think of something. Let's say that we want to return a float, which is going to be weight in kilograms. Let's say we have a really smart animal that can do conversions. If you wanted to create a method here that is going to receive a float, that's how you would define that. And you could say weight in pounds is the attribute that's going to be passed to this method so this is going to be the method name or the function name it is going to return a float right here it is going to receive a float right here and the float that it receives is going to get the name weight in pounds we could also set this up so that we will be able to return a string and in this situation you got to put the star inside of there and let's call this one talk to me and it is going to receive an ns string sent to it and that ns string is going to be whatever the person's name is and it's going to pop out a little bit of information directed at whatever the person's name was let's say that you also want to receive multiple different parameters well this guy's going to return an integer and we're going to call the method here get sum and it's going to receive an integer let's call that number one and then we can go to the next line here and say next number and this is going to be an integer and number two and this next number right here this can have any name you it doesn't matter what it is what's important here is get sums the name of the method it's going to receive two attributes one being number one and then the other one being number two both of which being integers it's going to sum them and return those as an integer well now what we're going to be able to do is jump into the animal.m file this guy right here and implement all of those methods that we just created now you can see it has a reference to the animal.h file which is where we defined what we want to create 
right? And here, let's say we want to throw in the initialization file, or the constructor as it's very often called. Let's do something a little bit interesting here. Let's come over and open this guy up. And then let's specifically come on down here to where this guy is right here. Click on that. Then down inside of here, we're going to click and we're going to go init. See right here, objective C, init method. That's going to allow us to drag and drop this over here. And it's automatically going to put in all the code that we are going to need for initialization method that we want to create. This is the default. It's called init. Remember over here, we defined we also wanted to have another init with name. So one is going to set the name if it's available and the other one is not because it's not available. And this allows us to think about a couple other different things. Whenever we have self inside of here, self refers to the instance being initialized because we have no idea what the animal object's name is outside of here. So anytime, this is like this in many other programming languages. So anytime we want to refer to an instance by itself, then we would just use self inside of here. This is a call to the super class, and it's going to perform any initializations that are needed there. And the super class is going to be NS object, this guy right here. And then down inside of here, what we could do is we could say self for the object being created. We could change the name or create a default name of no name whenever the object is generated. And then we'll know that our animal hasn't been assigned a name yet. Now what we can do is we can create our customized init. And how we're going to do that is this again is going to reserve an instance type. And that just means this animal instance type. It's just a generic way to refer to initializations. And in this situation, we have init with name and default name. You can see all those things automatically popped inside of there as we defined them here. See, default name, all this stuff automatically jumps right in there, makes it very easy to create these methods. And in here, what we're basically going to do is the same thing we have here, except we're going to actually define the name that we want to use, which in this situation is going to be the default name that was passed inside. So default name, right like that. Now we need to define all the other different methods that are going to be needed that we defined in our header section. So let's come in and define get info first off. And let's just make this really generic. Let's go nslog. And for now, we're just going to have this just be random info that. We could then go and get our float method we we're going to create. We could then go and define our weight in kilograms method that we went and created and automatically generate that for us. And we're just going to take weight in pounds, multiply that times 0 0.4535. We had another one. This one is going to return an integer. And this is get sum. See it automatically generated all that for us. Here we could just go return and then this would be number one plus number two. Now it comes down to one of our last methods we defined, which is talk to me. Again, ns string like this. Make sure you put the star inside of there. And then let's define talk to me. And in this situation, we're going to define an ns string, which is going to be, let's put a response inside of here. It's equal to ns string, string with format. And here we can say hello, at symbol, and then my name. So whatever name they pass inside, it's automatically going to respond as if it knows who that person is. So then we can say return response. Okay, so now that we have those objects defined, we can go back into main.m and start playing around with them. So if we want to create a new animal object, we just say animal. And let's say this first animal is dog, pointer to the dog object. And we're just going to come in here and go animal, which is defining the object type allocate some memory for me, and then we'll call init, which is going to initialize everything for us. That's how we create a dog object or animal object. We could then call for a method to execute dog. Let's try get info, and that's how we would call that, just like we saw previously. We're gonna wanna come up here though and import our animal.h file. Make sure you do that, otherwise you won't be able to call all these. If we wanted to get a value that is stored inside of an instance, just use nslog, something like the dog's name is, and then to get the dog name, we'll just say dog name, like that, automatically, that's called a getter, and they're automatically generated. That's a way to get the name for our dog. We could then also come in and set the value, set name, that's how it's done. And let's say we want to call our dog spot. Well, it's going to be called spot now and run it just to show that everything's working here. See, random info printed out. That's what that method did. Dog's name starts off as no name and then it gets changed to spot. So just to show you that the objects are working here and we're creating animal objects. We could also call the custom init that we generated. Let's have cat is equal to 
call the custom init. We're going to go animal, allocate memory, just like we did before. Except in this situation, we're going to go init with name. Remember, we provided that. And in this situation, we'll say whiskers is the custom name. And if you don't remember, that's from over here. Da, 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 da. See, init with name. So we're calling that instead of calling this initialize file. Now, you don't always need to access variables using dog name like this. We're also going to be able to come in and get those using a dot operator. And let's just do that with a cat here. The cat's name is and sign at, and we can just say cat.name, and then let's just call all of the other different functions that we created here just to show that they work. So let's say we go 180 pounds is equal to, and let's get this converted into kilograms, F, K, G, and once again to call for that method to execute, we just go whatever the method's name is, weight in kilograms, and then we pass in 180, there's the attribute, and there that is. Again, we could just come in here and pass in multiple attributes just to show you how that's done. So three plus five is equal to, and that's going to return an integer. And to pass in multiple integers or multiple attributes, we're gonna go get sum, call the method that we want to pass in there, and we wanna pass in a three, and then the next number we're gonna pass in is a five. If we wanna pass in a string inside of here, percent sign, at symbol, and here we'll go dog, talk to me, and then we'll pass in my name. And there you can see I executed all those and how they all work. Okay, so there's multiple different ways to deal with multiple different types of methods with different types of attributes and different types of return values, all on custom animal objects. Another thing that's neat is we're going to be able to create, let's say, another animal type, let's say a koala bear that inherits all the attributes or variables from the animal class as well as all of the methods automatically. And we just come in here and right click on this and say new file. This opens up and we're going to say source coca class and we're going to say next and we'll call this koala and subclass of, this is going to be of animal and Objective-C, of course, nothing else is gonna change there. And then just click on Create. And now we have a subclass named Koala that's gonna inherit everything from our animal class. And how we know it inherited everything from the animal class is there it is right there. That is how we know that it's inheriting all that stuff. Now in the header file for Koala, we can come in here and override methods, for example. So let's keep this nice and short and a string. And let's say that I want to overwrite the talk to me. I could overwrite everything if I want. Keep everything the same here in our header file. Then jump into this koala part right here. Again, and a string and the method I want to override. Jump into here and just get this just to save some time. Talk to me. Paste that in there. And we'll say hello, ba da 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 da, says, and then we'll get the koala's name to show up inside of there. And how we can do that again is self dot name. That's how we refer to that. So we went and overrided that guy. We could then create custom methods that are only available inside of Koala. Jump over into our header section and let's say void form trick. Let's call it that. And it's not going to receive any attributes. And then we'll create another one, void, and we'll call this one make sound, just to show that we can create all of these guys. Save that, jump over into Koala, and then let's define all those. So dash void form trick, there that is. And we'll define what it's going to do. And it's log, and we'll say that we want to put the name of the koala inside of here, whatever that's going to be. Forms a handstand, self name, there it is. And then we'll define also our other guy, and that's make sound, and it's log, and we'll just say he yawns, self name. Now we can jump back over into main and make our koala do stuff. So it's an object, it's a koala object, and it is a reference, it's an object. Let's call it Herbie is equal to, and it's going to be koala object, going to allocate it some memory. Say we want to initialize it by name. Oh, make sure we come up here and actually reference the koala header file. There it is. And then pass inside of here. Let's call him Herbie. So now our koala has a name. And then we can demonstrate our overridden method that we created here. And we can call our Herbie method, talk to me, and then pass inside of it my name. See how that changes. And actually, I think I'm going to take those other methods that I created in the koala and demonstrate something else. So, And if we run up, oh, unexpected, da 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 da, oh, make sure we put an at symbol right there. Whoops, make sure we take that out of there and execute it. And there you can see, hello Derek, and hello Derek Sars Harvey. So that's how we overrode those and how they work. 
Now categories are going to allow us to split our class into many different files and at the same time keep our file sizes manageable. And how we're going to create a category is once again come up here, right click on this, File New, and then we're going to click on Objective C File, not Coca Class, Objective C File, click on Next, come down here, click on Category, and I'm going to call this Exam. And the class specific to it is going to be Animal, and click on Next, and then click on Create. And it's going to create animal plus exam.h. Now in our header file that we have here for animal exam, at runtime we're going to be able to add methods as part of the animal class. And what this one's going to do is create something that's a boolean and let's call it checked by that and create another one, say it returns nothing and get shots. Then we'll be able to save that, jump over into the implementation file here, .m, and implement these guys. So let's go and create a boolean, check by vet, and what it's going to do, just to keep it simple, we'll go return one for true, just say by default it is checked by the vet, and then we'll go and define the other guy, get shots, ns log, and we'll say that whenever this calls it's automatically going to say that whatever the name of the object is got its shots. There you go, real simple. Now what we'll be able to do, jump back over into main, right like this, and let's continue working with Herbie. We could then go ns log at did percent sign at check if Herbie got its shots. Of course we could have that set to a variable and turn it on, turn it off, and get Herbie's name, followed by Herbie checked by that, and then also Herbie get shots and call that method. And then to get that to work, all we're gonna need to do is import that category, and that's just animal exam, automatically is going to place that inside of there, and all of that's going to work. And there you can see, did Herbie receive shots? Yes, Herbie got it shots. Another thing we can do is allow files to import a category, but at the same time block access unless the class is a subclass. So we're not going to be able to work with anything unless it is a subclass of this class that we're working with. So we're going to come over here, right click on this, File, New File, again Source, this is going to be an Objective-C file, click on Next, and I'm going to call this Protected, this is going to be a category as well, or actually let's call this Vet. Category, Type Animal, click Next, Create, there that is, jump over here to the header file, and then instead of Vet, this is going to be called Protected. Let's define our method we want to create here, Void, and then let's call it get exam results, something that would be maybe private. Then be able to jump down here and implement that, get exam results, and a slog, and we'll just put something exam is fine, doesn't matter. Now what we can do is jump back over into animal, implementation area right here, and then let's say something like in the get info area, if we wanted to specifically call that, we could just very easily come in here and go self, get exam results, of course we have to come in here and import this, there's that, animal, that and then get exam results. Close that off and that's how easy it was to add that protected method. And then of course if we wanted to call that we could just come in here and go dog and get info of course and that would automatically call that. As you can see exam is fine printed out there on the screen. Now just to say I've covered pretty much everything I'm also going to cover protocols and I started doing that a little bit with Herbie the koala and we're just going to come in here again right click on this and say new file except an Objective-C file is fine, and we click on Next, and this is going to be a protocol right here, and I'm going to call this Beauty Contest, and a protocol is just going to be a bunch of properties and methods that any class is going to be able to implement, and you can see it doesn't have any animal class or any other reference to a class. Click on Create, and here is Beauty Contest, which is going to have just the header file part of it, and here we're just going to define the methods and then stick them in any place that we feel like putting them. And I, like I said, I already started doing this with the koala perform trick. There it is. So I generated that. Jump over into the koala. And you can see I didn't need to define it right here. I just need to come in and define that I want it right here. Beauty contest. There it is. And now I can jump directly down into the implementation and define perform trick and look cute or whatever I wanted to put inside of there. So let's come in here and go look cute. There's void. Look cute. And we'll say Herbie acts super cute, or at least that's the way it works because his name's Herbie. Self and name. And that's in the Koala implementation file. And if we jump back into main, we can see that we can just go like this Herbie, look cute, and that's going to call that. And then Herbie, form trick. And then to implement that, you're just going to have to go over into your header section right here and add that in as well. So, beauty contest, 
like this, close that off, file save that, jump over into main, execute it, and there he is. Herbie acts super cute, Herbie performs a handstand. Really easy to just slide those methods in right there. Now to make sure I cover just about everything, I'm gonna go over a block or an anonymous function in Objective-C. How you would create one of those is you would define whatever your type's gonna be. We're gonna say at, say I wanna create an anonymous function called get area. Then we're going to define exactly what is passed into it. So the height as well as the width are gonna be passed inside of it. You're then going to assign the block to get area. How you do that, there's that. Carrot symbol, float, and then we're gonna say float width, float height. Define exactly what it is gonna do. It's gonna return the width times the height to get our area. And then make sure you put a semicolon at the end of that. And then you're gonna be able to come in here and just use it. So we say something like at area of three width and 50 height, and that's going to be a float and then we'll just be able to go get area just like any other thing by passing in 3 and 50 and you can see there it worked so that's how we create blocks enums are going to be used whenever you want to define a custom variable with a set of constants and how you do that is just go enum let's say you want to do like movie ratings or something like that you could come in here and go poor is equal to 1 okay is equal to 2 I don't know great is equal to 5 so forth and so on and then if you wanted to assign those values, you go enum ratings, which is the name of it, and matrix rating, or for the movie, the matrix, and you could just define great inside of there, and you just go matrix, percent sign u, matrix rating, like that. Oh, make sure you put a semicolon right there, and there you can see matrix five shows up automatically. And then the final thing I'm gonna talk about is dynamic binding. And this is basically going to allow us to create objects, subclasses that all have a superclass type that they would share. Okay, and to demonstrate this, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my animal header file, this guy right here, and I'm going to initialize a new method, and this is gonna be void, and it's going to be called make sound. Save that, then jump over here into my implementation file and define it, right like this. This is uh, very similar to what we'd call polymorphism, just allows us to refer to a group using the superclass. And let's say that this just goes grr. The default animal sound is grr. Let's go then and create another object. So file, file new, and let's call this, this is gonna be a coca class. Next, let's call this dog. Again, subclass of animal, objective C, click on next. Yes, create it. And then inside of the dog file, well, I want to jump over into the header section first. Inside of this, we're going to, well, actually, I don't have to do anything. It's automatically is going to get the make sound method, of course. However, I'm going to override it, and I'm going to say void make sound. This is in the implementation file, of course, and it's log. And here, I'm going to say something different. So we'll just say blank says wolf, and then refer to the dog's name. Over in the koala, da 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 da, do I? yes, I automatically I went and put make sound inside of here, so the koala and the dog are both going to have totally different sounds that they make, and that's going to allow me to come in here and demonstrate dynamic binding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a dog, let's call him Grover, equal to dog, allocate some memory, let's initialize him with name, also let's come in here and import dog, dot h initialize with name and his name's going to be grover now what i can do is create an array and refer to everything as animals in s array allocate some memory and then i'm going to knit with objects in this situation and the objects i'm going to put inside of it is going to be herbie and grover Let that last part be nil now i can create some generic ids which are just pointers to any type of object type they're as generic as anything could ever be i'll just refer to them as object one and we'll say that these animals is what I'm referring, and I'll say object at indexes, and I'm just gonna put zero. So you can see I'm working with the most generic type of object possible, and I'm throwing those into this array. And we'll call this object two, animals object. There's the second object in that tier. And now I can just come in and go object one, make sound, and object two, make sound, and it's automatically going to call the correct one. Whoop change this to index. And when you execute it, you can see automatically Herbie says yawn and Grover says wolf. So there you go, guys. I'm going to also include a couple other different things on my website that I didn't cover here, but I covered so many different things. 
Just wanted to cover as much as humanly possible. Please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.